the Wild West, often depicted as a realm of sheriffs, gunslingers, and saloons, carries with it a host of movie stereotypes. However, the true Old West is a more complex and fascinating place, filled with surprising elements like camels, instances of cannibalism, and an abundance of celebrities. In this video, we'll uncover some of the most facts about the Wild West that provide fresh insights into life on the frontier. The first quick-draw gunfight occurred in Springfield, Missouri. The famous showdown occurred between the legendary gunslinger Wild Bill Hickok and a man named Davis Tutt. Their dispute stemmed from a gambling disagreement, with Tutt attempting to outwit Hickok by backing other gamblers to beat him and force him out of town. Hickok, however, emerged victorious in the gambling showdown. The conflict escalated when Tut demanded $40 from Hickok regarding a previous deal involving a horse. Hickok initially paid Tut the $40, but Tut insisted on an additional $25. When Hickok refused to comply, Tut brazenly snatched Hickok's pocket watch from the table. The tension reached its breaking point the next day when Tut paraded the stolen pocket watch around the town square of Springfield, Missouri, on the morning of July 21st. 1865. Hickok attempted to reason with Tut, but Tut remained defiant. Shortly before 6 p.m. that day, Hickok warned Tut not to cross the square with the stolen watch. Tut reached for his gun, prompting Hickok to do the same. In a dramatic moment, they both drew their weapons, but Hickok fired the fatal shot, striking Tut in the heart. This historic confrontation became the first recorded quick-draw fight in history. Word of the showdown spread, and two years later, an illustration of the event accompanied an article in Harper's new monthly magazine. Millions of bison were slaughtered. In the early 1800s, America was home to a vast number of bison, with estimates ranging from 10 to 30 million. However, by the early 1900s, their population had plummeted to fewer than 1,000. The American buffalo, also known as bison, fell victim to ruthless slaughter. Many were shot by individuals commissioned by the United States Army, or even by the Army itself. Beginning in 1830, the U.S. government aimed to eradicate these animals, which were a primary source of food and hides for Native Americans. During hunting expeditions, one colonel famously declared, Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. Even the legendary Buffalo Bill Cody is credited with killing as many as 4,000 bison in just two years. In 1889, their numbers hit rock bottom, with only 256 buffalo in captivity. Fortunately, efforts have since been made to protect and conserve these magnificent creatures. Today, the bison population has rebounded to an estimated 150,000, 200,000. If you're interested in witnessing bison in their natural habitat, consider visiting Yellowstone National Park. Dead outlaws were propped up and photographed. During the Wild West era, the exploits of gangs and notorious outlaws often became sensationalized in newspapers across the country and further embellished in contemporary books. When these outlaws met their demise, whether in a blaze of glory or not, there was a strong desire among townspeople to have tangible proof and authorities saw an opportunity to send a clear message to potential lawbreakers about the consequences they might face. The advent of photography during the first quarter of the 19th century provided a new means to achieve both of these objectives. Deceased outlaws and sometimes entire gangs would be arranged for a final photograph. These images captured the grim reality of their fate, serving as a testament to the dangers of a life of crime in the Old West before they were laid to rest, often six feet under. Cowboy meant criminal. In the Old West, particularly in regions like Arizona, the term cowboy could carry a different connotation, often associated with criminals. In 1881, the San Francisco Examiner published an editorial describing cowboys as the most reckless class of outlaws in that wild country, emphasizing their lawless reputation, which they deemed worse than that of typical robbers. Additionally, there was a notorious gang known as the Cowboys that was active in Tombstone, further contributing to the association of the term with criminal activities during that era. The photo provided shows members of Butch Cassidy's notorious gang, the Wild Bunch, 
which included individuals like Kid Curry, Bill McCarty, Bill Todd Carver, Ben Kilpatrick, and Tom O'Day. These outlaws were a significant part of the Wild West's criminal history. Cowboys didn't wear 10-gallon hats. In the Old West, hats were essential for outdoor activities, but they were not the oversized headpieces often associated with cowboys in Hollywood depictions of the 1920s. Instead, cowboys, ranchers, farmers, and individuals in various professions typically wore flat-brimmed Stetson hats known as the Boss of the Plains. These hats were designed by John Stetson, who noticed that the hats commonly worn on the plains were ill-suited for the harsh weather conditions. Straw, silk, fur, and wool hats were either too hot in the summer or prone to absorbing rain during the spring. The boss of the plains was a lightweight, waterproof, and durable hat. Its interior was insulated enough to serve as a bucket for carrying water for horses, while its wide brim provided protection from the sun for the wearer's neck and eyes. These hats were sold for $4.50, which, when adjusted for inflation, is equivalent to about $74 in today's purchasing power. A quarter of cowboys were black. The American West's history includes a significant but often overlooked contribution from African-American cowboys. Contrary to the portrayal in many Hollywood westerns, approximately one in four cowboys during that era was black. When American ranchers settled in regions like Texas, they often brought enslaved individuals with them. These enslaved people were later tasked with tending to cattle herds while their owners were away, especially during the Civil War. After the abolition of slavery, these newly freed individuals found work as cowhands and became valuable members of the cattle industry. One notable African-American figure from the Old West was Bass Reeves, who gained fame as the first U.S. Deputy Marshal West of the Mississippi River. Over the course of his three-decade career, Reeves apprehended over 3,000 criminals, leaving a lasting legacy as one of the Old West's most respected lawmen. You could see famous gunmen perform for shows. Imagine going to a stage play in New York City to see Buffalo Bill Cody and Wild Bill Hickok tell tall tales around a campfire. That's exactly what happened. Cody came up with a traveling show called Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, and he had several different cast members. The most famous of all was Hickok. There weren't just stage shows either. There were staged buffalo hunts and recreations of famous events like a stagecoach robbery. Cody also had a parade in 1902, and you can see the video at the Library of Congress. Swinging saloon doors were real, not a Hollywood invention. The iconic swinging saloon doors that are a staple of Western movies were not a Hollywood invention, but were indeed commonly used during the Old West era. These batwing-style doors served practical purposes in the small and often crowded saloons of the time. Saloons during the Old West were typically quite small, roughly the size of an average bedroom. Given the lack of modern amenities like air conditioning and ventilation, these establishments could quickly become hot and filled with smoke from cigars and pipes. The batwing-style doors were designed to provide a bit of privacy while allowing fresh air to circulate helping to alleviate some of the stale, smoky, and odorous conditions inside. Moreover, these doors were open enough to allow the sounds of music and laughter to drift out onto the street, enticing potential customers to step inside. Due to the high crime rate in certain areas of the West, saloons often featured a double door system. During operating hours, the swinging doors were used, but when the saloon closed, solid floor-to-ceiling doors with sturdy locks were employed to safeguard the establishment and its contents including the valuable whiskey. Women were welcome in saloons. In the 1800s, it was exceptionally rare to find women drinking in bars alongside men, particularly east of the Missouri River. However, as you ventured further west, away from the constraints of Puritan values, you'd encounter a different scene where women mingled freely with men. Among these women, some were prostitutes, commonly known as painted ladies who might loiter around seedy bars in search of customers. Others were dance hall women, serving as entertainers and hostesses. They would liven up the atmosphere, singing, dancing, and engaging in conversation with male patrons, all while encouraging them to spend more money at the bar. As reported by Legends of America, saloon girls could earn around $10 per week in the 1800s, which would be equivalent to approximately $205 in 1870 currency. 
Additionally, they often received commissions based on the drinks they managed to sell, further boosting their earnings. Although prostitution is a well-known Wild West occupation, women worked other jobs, too. Prostitution was indeed a common occupation for women due to the gender imbalance, with men significantly outnumbering women. As a result, the services of prostitutes were in high demand, and they often outnumbered other women by a ratio of 25 to 1. However, it's important to note that prostitution was not the only job option available to single women in the Old West. There were also roles for women as saloon girls, dance hall girls, and hostesses who provided entertainment by singing, dancing, and engaging in conversations with patrons. These female entertainers typically earned a base salary of $10 per week, along with commissions on the drinks they helped sell. They would often socialize with patrons, encourage them to buy drinks at the bar, and thereby earn additional income. While some of these women may have chosen to offer sexual services as prostitutes, Others worked strictly as entertainers, providing a range of services to meet the demands of the diverse clientele in the Wild West. The stage plays were poorly done. Buffalo Bill Cody's indoor stage plays were far from polished theatrical productions. In fact, they often fell into the category of being so bad that they became entertaining in their own right. The participants in these plays, including Cody and Hickok, were not experienced actors, and the quality of the writing left much to be desired. Typically, these stage plays featured Cody and his companions gathered around a campfire, sharing stories and cracking jokes. However, the amateurish acting and delivery often resulted in the audience erupting in laughter for all the wrong reasons. In one particularly memorable incident, Hickok, whether due to anger, inebriation, or a combination of both, took out his pistol during a performance and shot out a stage light right in front of the live audience. This unexpected and unconventional act undoubtedly left a lasting impression on those in attendance. Gun control laws were strict in some towns. Laws were... It's interesting to note that despite the Wild West's reputation for lawlessness, some towns like Deadwood and Dodge City had strict gun control laws in place. Visitors to these towns were required to check their firearms with the local sheriff and received a token or receipt in exchange. This policy was implemented to prevent newcomers from causing trouble during their visits. However, residents of these towns were generally allowed to keep firearms in their homes for self-defense purposes. This approach helped strike a balance between maintaining law and order in public spaces while still allowing individuals to protect themselves within their own residences. The first armed bank robbery occurred in Massachusetts. The first bank robbery in the United States didn't occur during the Wild West era. In fact, it happened much earlier, in 1831, approximately 30 years before the Wild West era began. However, this initial robbery was carried out using forged keys, and firearms were not involved. The first recorded armed bank robbery where assailants used firearms took place in 1863 in Malden, Massachusetts. This deadly event unfolded at noon when Edward Green, a 32-year-old postmaster in the town, entered Malden Bank with the intention of getting change. Green, burdened by heavy debts and struggling with alcoholism, saw this as an opportunity to escape his financial troubles. At the time, only one person was working in the bank, a 17-year-old boy who was the son of the bank's president. After entering the bank on December 15th, Green left but returned home to retrieve his firearm. He then shot the young bank employee in the head and left the premises with $5,000 in cash, which is equivalent to over $105,000 in today's currency. Green's sudden financial improvement aroused suspicion, and it wasn't long before people began to question how the previously debt-ridden postmaster could suddenly pay his dues. Reportedly, Green confessed to the murder approximately a month later. He was subsequently hanged in 1866, making him the first person in the United States to be executed for committing an armed bank robbery. The whiskey was terrible. 
If you walked into an Old West saloon expecting to be served a smooth glass of Kentucky whiskey, you'd likely be in for a bitter disappointment. The whiskey served during that era did not adhere to the high standards and regulations that modern whiskey production follows. In the Old West, there were few regulations governing the content and quality of alcoholic beverages. As a result, what was often sold as whiskey in those saloons was a dubious concoction that might contain some actual whiskey mixed with various other ingredients. These ingredients could include creek water, distilled molasses, grain alcohol, cider vinegar, fruit juice, axle grease, and who knows what else. These early whiskeys were given colorful nicknames, reflecting their often dubious quality. Terms like coffin varnish, mountain howitzer, and tangle leg were used to describe them. The last one, tangle leg, referred to booze so potent that your legs might become entangled as you tried to leave the bar due to its intense strength. It's no wonder you found yourself gagging on a drink that tasted more like gasoline than aged bourbon. Breakfast on the trail was grueling work. Breakfast on the road for westward pioneers was a far cry from today's quick trips to Starbucks for a coffee and bagel. It involved a lot of hard work and reliance on staple foods like coffee and bacon. Traveling in a wagon train required an early start, usually around 4 o'clock in the morning. This early wake-up time was necessary to prepare breakfast, break camp, saddle up the horses, and round up the cattle. Coffee and bacon were the mainstays of their morning meal. The women in the group were responsible for starting the fire and roasting green coffee beans in a skillet. After roasting, the beans were ground using a coffee grinder and then brewed with water over the open fire. It was a time-consuming process compared to today's coffee makers. In addition to coffee, slabs of bacon were fried up in the skillet, providing much-needed sustenance for the day ahead. Cornmeal gruel might also be part of the breakfast menu on a good day. Bacon wasn't just a morning treat. It was a dietary staple, and pioneers often consumed it two or three times a day. Well-smoked and cured bacon had the potential to last the entire journey, although the reality of that may have been a bit skeptical. Mining towns were more expensive than living in Silicon Valley today. The California gold rush triggered a frenzied rush to the hills, giving birth to mining camps and towns almost overnight. This surge in population and demand for goods sent prices soaring to astronomical levels, resulting in rampant price gouging. Believe it or not, it was often more expensive to live in certain California towns during this era than it is to reside in Silicon Valley today. Here's a glimpse of what you might expect to pay in 1851 in California's bustling mining towns. A single egg could set you back as much as $3, which equates to about $105 in today's currency. A pound of butter might cost you $20, or approximately $700 by today's standards. Gold pans that once sold for a mere $0.20 dollars just two years prior were now commanding $8 equivalent to a hefty $280 today. Shovels were selling for a staggering $36, an astounding $1,159 in today's money. It's worth noting that the majority of miners struggled to unearth a mere $10 to $15 worth of gold each day, which makes the exorbitant costs of everyday items even more astonishing. Frontier folks embraced poop-powered cooking. Know what the Great Plains didn't have? Trees. Know what the Great Plains had a lot of? Buffalo poop. In the treeless expanse of the Great Plains, pioneers had to find alternative sources of fuel for their campfires, and they turned to buffalo dung for this purpose. The Great Plains lacked trees, making it challenging to find traditional firewood. In this landscape, dried buffalo dung became a valuable resource for fuel. While it may seem unsanitary and unappealing, Buffalo dung, often humorously referred to as meadow pies or prairie chips, had practical uses. When burned, dried buffalo dung produced a quick, hot, and surprisingly odorless fire, making it an efficient choice for cooking and keeping warm. The key was to find dung that had thoroughly dried out in the hot sun, rather than using fresh or moist dung.
Despite its unconventional nature, buffalo dung served as a practical and readily available source of fuel for pioneers on the Great Plains. The California Gold Rush wasn't the first in America. In 1799, in Cabarrus County, North Carolina, a young boy stumbled upon a gold nugget while fishing on his family's property. Initially unsure of its nature, he eventually took it to a jeweler a few years later. Upon selling it, he discovered its true value and embarked on a quest to find more gold on his land, successfully uncovering additional pieces. The second significant gold rush occurred in Georgia in 1828. The exact person responsible for the initial discovery remains unclear, but reports of gold findings began pouring in from northern Georgia, attracting numerous prospectors. In White County, located in the eastern part of the state, more gold was discovered in creeks and rivers. The renowned California gold rush took place in 1848 at Sutter's Mill. James Wilson Marshall was in the process of building a sawmill along the American River when he stumbled upon gold. Despite his discovery in January, it initially went largely unbelieved. However, in May of 1848, a storekeeper displayed bottles filled with gold dust, finally convincing thousands to make their way to California in pursuit of their own gold fortunes. The California Gold Rush of 1849 was one of the key events. The California Gold Rush of 1849 marked a significant turning point in the history of the Wild West and the United States as a whole. It began with the discovery of gold in California in 1848, and news of this precious metal's presence spread rapidly, triggering a massive influx of people from around the world who hurried to California in pursuit of gold. These individuals, famously known as 49ers, were lured by the promise of wealth and opportunities. Many of them chose to remain in California even after the gold rush had concluded, contributing to the establishment and development of the American West. The impact of the gold rush was profound, shaping the region's economy and culture. It led to the creation of towns and cities and the growth of industries such as mining and agriculture. Furthermore, the gold rush played a pivotal role in the westward expansion of the United States by encouraging migration and settlement in the Western territories. The Wild West was a time of great innovation. The Wild West era was marked by significant innovation and technological advancements that brought about substantial changes in the lives of its inhabitants. The introduction of railroads and telegraphs played a crucial role in revolutionizing transportation and communication throughout the western frontier. These innovations made it more efficient and rapid to transport goods, people, and information across vast distances, effectively shrinking the geographical barriers. The telegraph in particular played a pivotal role in swiftly disseminating news and information. Its ability to transmit messages over long distances played a role in curbing some of the lawlessness and violence that characterized early Western settlements. Simultaneously, the emergence of groundbreaking inventions like the Colt Revolver and the Winchester Rifle transformed the nature of conflict and gunfights in the West. These firearms became accessible to both criminals and law enforcement, influencing the dynamics of battles in the region. The Colt Revolver, renowned for its reliability and rapid firing capability, gained immense popularity during this era, becoming one of the most iconic weapons of the time. These technological advancements left an enduring mark on the history and culture of the Wild West. Want to dine like the Old West? You probably don't. Food in the Wild West often left much to be desired in terms of culinary delight. However, there were exceptions, particularly when it came to breakfast. A morning meal might include more appetizing options such as cornbread, stew, boiled eggs, fried potatoes, and omelets. Dinner, on the other hand, could feature less appealing choices like calves' head, boiled mutton, or soused calves' feet. For those with a sweet tooth, pudding might be offered as dessert. These were typical foods for families living on the frontier in 1853. Food preparation in the Wild West was relatively straightforward, relying on basic tools like ovens, frying pans, and roasting spits. The availability of ingredients was also subject to the season, with cowboys often relying on canned beans, rock-hard biscuits, dried meat, dried fruit, and coffee as staples of their diet. Many brands from the Old West are still around. 
If you were transported to the Old West and found yourself near a decent general store, you might encounter some familiar brands that were in existence during that time. These brands include Quaker Oats, Royal Baking Powder, Baker's Chocolate, Durkee, Arm and Up Hammer, Fleischmann's Yeast, Pillsbury Flour, The Long Branch Saloon of Gunsmoke. Fame really did exist in Dodge City, and still does. Sort of. The Long Branch Saloon, made famous by the television show. Gunsmoke actually existed in Dodge City, Kansas. While the exact year of its establishment is unclear, the original saloon was destroyed in the Front Street Fire of 1885. However, it was later rebuilt and now serves as a tourist attraction, complete with a reproduction bar and live entertainment. Interestingly, the original Long Branch Saloon served a variety of beverages, including milk, tea, lemonade, sarsaparilla, alcohol, and beer. This historical tidbit adds an intriguing twist for fans of the show, imagining Marshal Matt Dillon and Festus enjoying milk mustaches in between their law enforcement duties.